Hello and welcome to the West London Sport QPR podcast on the back of Rangers' dramatic, unlikely and potentially crucial victory at all conquering champions Burnley last Saturday. Um, it was a result that had every single Rangers fan saying, isn't that the most QPR thing ever? And to paraphrase that line from Michael Corleone and the Godfather, just when we thought they were out, they pull us back in. Uh, now, I was actually working at the Brentford Villa game last Saturday and frankly too nervous to look at the score updates, uh, especially after a mate of mine texted me about 10 minutes into the game to say Burnley should be 4 0 up. Um, now, I knew it was 1 all with about 10 minutes to go, and uh, having seen the possession stats, which is about 81% to 19, you know, I fully expected to hear Burnley had scored a late winner as they uh, so often have this season. But it wasn't to be, as Chris Martin, no doubt inspired by Gareth Ainsworth, showing the team a video about Muhammad Ali before the match. He rose to deliver the knockout punch three minutes from time. Uh, now I'm joined, as always, by former Rangers skipper Kevin Gallen, and uh, once again by BBC Radio Six Music's Paul Stokes. Hello, gents. Hello. Hello. Um, now, Kev, we gave Gareth Ainsworth and the team a bit of bit of warranty criticism on here last week, so I guess it's only fair we give them some credit for two you know decent results against Norwich last Wednesday, and then and then at Turf Moor. What was your reaction to uh, to both games? Two, obviously, excellent results. Um, I think I think when we last week done the podcast, uh, Ian, it was the criticism was warranted, uh, and the praise will be warranted for two um, magnificent results, especially the one against um, Burnley. Um, I wasn't, I didn't get to see him. I've been away, and uh, but I was getting a lot of updates. I was on my phone. Also, my son was updating me. I felt like I was there the amount of times he was texting me, what's going on, and other QPR fans. And my two brothers were at the Norwich game and they, I was sort of having text messages with them. So two good results, much needed. Um, I believe I believe that will we'll definitely stay up now um, because of that incredible result against Burnley. Unexpected, but as... Uh, as everyone was saying on Twitter, on whatever, on social media, that was the most QPR result. Is it QPR? Not Spursy, but QPRZ. That was this. Uh, just when, just when you didn't think anything. I mean, that game. I mean, I always, I always think QPR have got a chance in every game, and I expect them to do something and get something, and it doesn't happen because you know certain things happens in games, and you know. But for that game against Burnley. I remember thinking before the game, we have got no chance. And then thinking, well, every time I think we have no chance, something happens. So, you know, I might go, my prediction against Stoke could be, we have no chance. <laughs> That's the way I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, fair play. I mean, under a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, Burnley by far the best team in the championship, which they proved by winning the title. And to go up there and, uh, and nick three points was, you know, very unexpected, but congratulations. And uh, I do believe that will keep us in the Championship next season. Paul, I know you're um, very much a look-up, not-down kind of kind of man. Do you agree with Kev? Do you, know, do you think that's the uh, the result that's, you know, we'll, we'll keep keep you in, in the Championship? Well, I bought a ticket. I'm going to go into the Stoke uh, game on Saturday. And I did buy a ticket for that a couple of weeks ago when they weren't on sale. And about five days after that, I think I thought I had bought a ticket to watch QPR getting relegated. That's how sort of I felt the results were going. Uh, I don't feel that way uh, now after Burnley, because I, I think you look at the fixtures as well, the teams that are playing each other, that kind of thing. I would just like a minimum of a point at Stoke just to make sure that would be just, just for my, I wouldn't want to go to, to, to the last game of the season at home and have anything on it if possible. So um, I think Kevin's right, but I'm, the qpr of me won't say it out loud until, uh, until, until, until we know for sure. And I think as well, if you get that point or get something or three points even against Stoke, then it will be a good last game at, at Loftus Road because then you would be able to be a little bit more expansive and a little bit more back to the style of football. I think that people, um, I expect to see, and I'm sure the team want to play. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually I watched the the full ninety minutes of back of the game, and you know, to be honest, it was the first half really was. I don't think I've seen a more one sided game of football ever. I mean, it was, you know, poor Aaron Drew at right back was getting torn apart by um by Zahori, and um, you know, it was an interesting decision I thought um, by Ainsworth not to start. Ethan Laird um, for the game and uh, 
you know, uh, he was obviously left out of the squad entirely for the um, for the Norwich game, despite obviously Kakai being out for the season. Um, uh, on the bench at Turf Moor at the start of the game and came on and, and did really well. Set up the first goal, will be far a long throw. And Rangers looked a lot more solid with him there. Um, now, here's what Gareth Ainsworth actually said in his press conference this morning about um, Ethan Laird and the way he responded to being dropped um, from the side. People react when you leave players out of the squad and, and question it and wonder why. And I think that all I can say is, as the manager, I think it's uh, it's my job to get the best out of these players. And if that, if leaving someone out of the squad gets the best out of them, then um, I think it's the right decision. Um, but people will still probably think it was the wrong one or whatever. But uh, it was a uh, it was a great reaction from anything. That's all I say. He's a good lad, uh, and we forget he's a very young lad. He's younger than Aaron Drew. People don't even realise that. You know, he's a uh, He's a very young boy and these players are here to develop um, and that's all part of his development. Putting someone like Aaron Drew in a game like that, it, it, it seemed a, a big risk for the manager and perhaps he got away with it, albeit by Drew picking up a groin injury, or, sorry, calf injury right on the stroke of half time. Yeah, I mean, I think even Les had a, I mean, he had a, like the whole team, he had a really good start to the season and I was very impressed with him, especially the way he could get up on the pitch and carry the ball up the pitch. He was sort of was like a, you know, right back come right winger and uh, I was very impressed with him at the start of the season but I could say that about numerous players um, but I do feel that in crucial games you've got to play your best players and like you said maybe got away with it when um, Aaron Drew got injured or whatever and not having the best game he, you just mentioned that the left winger of Burnley was giving him a bit of a torrid time uh, Ethan Lev's a good player I always believe you play your best players whatever games and then see what happens uh, because you don't want to have that that thing in the back of your head why didn't I play my better players it didn't work out today so always just try and play I always believe play your best players if they're fit you know if, if, if Ethan Les carrying us an injury we don't know about I don't know but um I, I, I've look he's, he's a lad who's come on loan I think uh this is is this the most he's ever played in the season yeah yeah so you know, he's a, that's, that's his, he's a young lad. I think he's a pretty. I think he's a decent player. I mean, I remember talking to you in October and um, maybe just November, sort of saying, you know, we were talking about right backs at Man United. Will Will Ethan Led go on loan? Will he be sold for Man United? And you were maybe saying, well, they might keep him and he might be potentially be sort of maybe back up or pushing for a place in the Man United team because Wamba Zaka was having a bit of a torrid time. So that's how highly we were thinking of him at the start of the season. So, look, the whole the whole squad really dropped off. Maybe Field has really been sort of the most consistent player throughout the season, where he's played, you know, even at the back, midfield. But he's always been sort of a six, seven out of ten every game. And, you know, you can never sort of say, oh, he's dropped below a five. Um, but Ethan Laird, I think he's a good, good attacking right back. And... They'll only get better as uh, as the seasons go on for me. Paul, um, Kev mentioned Samfield there, and I think he's played every game this season, which is you know a rarity in itself. Having someone that's been you know able to stay fit for that that <laughs> that length of time, and I guess it's credit to him as well because he you know he arrived at QBR with a bit of a, a checkered injury past, but um, you know very very good finish for the first goal, and he you know for you has he been player of the season? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've already cast my vote, which which is bad with two games to go. I've already cast my vote for Sandfield, definitely. Um, I mean, I think this is his best season for QPR, probably his best season, I would say, imagine in professional football. He's just, even with everything that's been going on, he's he's not really a player I've ever seen being flapped in a game, you know, lost his temperament when, you know, you know things have been going bad. But at the same time, he does seem to be, you know, a, 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 the sort of guy that you could see will be really useful in, you know, organising and getting people doing stuff, the, the right things on the pitch. He, he strikes me as sort of player that I, may be a future manager type material. He has that sort of personality from what I can work out from, from the way he speaks. I have to say, when I was thinking about the goal on Burnley, the first thing that popped into my head uh, was another QPR game against Notts County, which I was in the uh, stands for, which I don't know if Kevin remembers, where uh, we pretty much scored from a throw-in as well. Do you remember that one, Kev? I do. Well, I, yeah, a long throw and a flip. Yeah, yeah a bizarre yeah. goal, really. Yeah, that, I do. that was what popped into my head. That goal, it was like, wow, that's a very. It was Boxing Day game, wasn't it? Yes, it was indeed. Yeah, yeah. My memory not bad. Yeah, 
I always remember the goals I scored. Nothing. Else. <laughs> Never remember the bad things. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. So, but yeah. Back to field. Yeah, he has been. He's been very consistent, and and everyone talks about players uh, like he's played because he hasn't got injured. But there's always a lot of talk about rotating. Oh, we need to refresh, and I'm not a big believer in that. But he's been he's been playing. He's sort of been on the team sheet, whether he's fresh or not. You know, he's been on the team sheet at every game. So you've got to congratulate him for that. And like you said, he's had a bit of an injury uh, prone past and he'll be feeling really good that he hasn't picked up any injuries. And I mean, I used to have an, a bit of an injury prone past and I came back and I ended up playing over 100 and something, 20 games on the spin. And for me, that was like an achievement because... You know, when you have to work on the, if you've got it, it had previous injuries, um, I believe that, and Sam Field, whatever injuries, and I used to have a lot of hamstring problems with nerves. I had to do, I had to be in the gym half an hour before training every day, doing certain exercises to build up my hamstrings, build up my glutes and stuff. And to be on fair, it was so boring, but you sort of just got to do it to just to get out on the pitch and play. And it takes a lot of, um, you know, time and a bit of dedication. So whatever Sam feels done, uh, well done to him and keep it going. Yeah. I mean, I, I was up at West Brom a few weeks ago and talking to a couple of the the local journos there and, uh, you know, they were still staggered that West Brom allowed him to leave. He was sort of regarded, uh, you know, as, um, you know, one of the best academy prospects they've had. And, you know, we talk about the lack of players that come through QBR's academy. Well, West Brom have got, you know, a category... Um, uh, level one academy and they were saying they just don't have anything coming through there either and Sam Phil was one of their better prospects and they let him go to QPR for I think it was about 300 grand um so it, it's I mean I really like him he's you know unlike a lot of young players he's, he's he's not all over social media I think he's even on social media he's a very kind of like you speak to him he's very down to earth he's very matter of fact about the role he plays and you know he's been a QPR certainly one of QPR's better signings in, in recent seasons um you know, another player that has been one of QPR's better signings in recent seasons is, is Rob Dickey. Will be he's had a, you know, by his sort of previously high standards, a really difficult season. But you know, he was at, you know back to Rob Dickey at his best, um, de certainly defensively anyway on on Saturday. And I mean, Kev, do you think there's a little bit of you know, when you're playing against a team like Burnley, you're raising your game a little bit on that? You know, you never know. You play well here, you might get a you might get a move or well. I wouldn't. If if players are going into the game thinking like that in a relegation must win game or must win get a something, then you know if I was going into that game, I'm not thinking about oh I can get a move here. I'm just thinking can I keep my team in the in the championship and not get relegated. So I mean I see I, I did watch the highlights and he made some very good uh, clearances and especially one off the line where you know the keeper was beaten. That would have been, you know, in the, what was that in the first 10, 15 minutes? It would have been, you know, really under pressure, um, more so than what the uh, QPR were. But yeah, I mean, it's great to see because he has, look, we're talking about players who have had the Torah time. I think everyone, I mean, there's no getting away from it. Uh, was it two wins in 20? I don't know. Look, they're the facts. The teams have been, the teams had a Torah time since um, the end of, no, the start of November when the World Cup ever since the end of October, it's been torrid. And uh, and it's great to see that Rob Dickey uh, comes out of that game with a much better performance. And now we can go into the next game feeling more confident than what he has been because confidence is a big thing in football. There's no doubt about it. If you're not, if you're feeling confident and you're feeling fit and you can, you run 90 minutes, it's a massive way to go to play in a, a good game of football. There's no doubt about that. I listened to an interview that, Dickie gave to uh, on the uh, the other QPR podcast um, earlier this week, and he, he spoke quite quite candidly actually, um, just about how difficult it has been this season, and you know how he completely lost his confidence not being in the side. He's always played regularly, the change of manager, that kind of thing. I mean, Paul, did you you know? I know you sit on the the LSE Road side of the ground. Have, have you seen a different side of him doing anything differently to what you've seen in previous seasons? He, you know, certainly in the home games, I mean, he, he had a bit of a, I think he got hauled off in 
I think it was the Preston game. He got taken off, and you know that was unheard of, really, for Rob Rob Dickey to be sort of taken off in a home game. Well, you know, it's good to see a player of his ability, kind of, you know, getting back to doing what he does best. Absolutely, I think there was just a sort of tenderness to what he was doing and what where he was positioning himself on the pitch. I mean, the game for me, which I'm sure you won't want reminding of, is the Rotherham away game where he actually, I've not seen a centre back probably make three more obvious mistakes that cause you three goals and you know and it was like and you know it, it happens but to a player of his the standards he set for himself you were going what's happened can he get back from this so I think you know to see the highlights from Burnley and also I mean the way he played obviously with Balogun going off injured you know he was sort of dropped and he's come back in again he's had to get his place back uh against Norwich I thought he, he, he there's just something about it maybe it is that moment where he probably thought oh Balogun's come in he's got he's got his fitness back I'm out now for the rest of the season the manager possibly thinks, you know, I'm not at my peak form. And then suddenly be handed that opportunity again to be a starter for the, the for the run in the really important games. Maybe that's just something that's clicked for him. I don't I mean I don't know how you look at that as a player. Do you think this is a great opportunity now? It's sort of a reset. I've been out of the team and now I'm back as a starter. But he just seems to have suddenly re- recovered that that that, that 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 sense that good defenders have of what's about to happen rather than just being like, oh I'll just, you know, Maybe I'll go over here and the ball might come. He just seems to be able to be reading the game in those last couple of games I've seen him live and from the highlights. That's that ability combined then with you know him as a footballer is suddenly all, all bonded back together, which is which is great to see, particularly considering how low he probably was form was. There's there's one thing though, Ian, is and that's last season when he did have a really good season, we played three at the back. And now majority of this season we played a flat back four. And uh Rob Dickey is not the most quickest and most powerful. So when you when you sort of got no one to cover you, if you do make a mistake, and I'm sure he made mistakes last season, but then you've got another two centre halves to come round and cover you, then then mistakes don't get highlighted. So if you make a mistake in a flat back four or two centre halves, those mistakes do get highlighted and they can they can end up as goals, but. Let's be fair, compared to last season, he hasn't been nowhere near that level. But Saturday, hopefully, is a turning point for him. Kevin, out of curiosity, as a player, you know, we talk about players being able to read games. Is that something that you do kind of goes in and out? You know, you may go for a phase where you're not reading the game as well as perhaps you would, would normally. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think you have a general read the game if you're reading the game well. Look, when you're centre half, everything's in front of you. Do you know what I mean? So you can you can read it a lot better than you know, say a centre forward. Well, you sort of can read where the if you're centre forward, you can read where the, maybe the midfield is going to pass it to you. But mm-hmm. a lot of it is you make the run for the midfielder to pass it to you. Yeah, not they pass. It. Do you know what I mean? You've got to make the movements to try and either come to feet or spin over the top. Where centre half, everything's in front of you, and you can read the game. The ball's going over there. You, you shuffle across and. And then let's be fair, the best centre halves out there are the ones who read it and never get themselves into tricky situations. I mean, if you're a centre half and you're playing against a centre forward who's a lot quicker than you and stronger than you, you don't go too tight. You sort of drop off a little bit and try and read it. And if the, you see the ball's coming into you, into the centre forward, you try and nick it in front. Or if you see the centre forward is now going to make a run over the top, you better be three yards ahead of him. So you're ready to, if he's quicker than you. So it is a lot to do with reading the game. But, you know, sometimes you get exposed as a centre-half in certain position, uh, in certain situations that if you if you are a leader and you're a talker, you can get the right back right nice close to you. Do you understand? And they have a centre-half. And it's a lot of talking and reading and, you know, understanding and, and organising is the main thing for uh, centre-halves. Uh, if you're exposed and you're not the quickest like Rob Dickey isn't, you don't want that ball going down the, that channel. So you get the right back in nice and nice and tight and nice and narrow so that ball's blocked. So you just organise your right back. Well, maybe the right back's not listening to him, but I don't know. But that's what I would do. Get in here. Alan McDonald would say that because he wasn't the quickest Evo and, and he, but he would read it very well, Alan Mac, because he wasn't the quickest and he would know when to drop and then when to get tight. So... It is a lot to do with reading, yeah. Mm. Now the, you know the the the, the, uh, the game plan from Gareth. We we did kind of touch on it last week, Kev. That you know the style of football, perhaps wasn't as easy on the eye as it 
has been in the past. Um, but I guess you go to Burnley. I mean, only a four would go to Burnley and just be open and try and you know try and play expansive football against a side that's full of confidence and you know scores shed loads of goals and you know going for um, looking to win the title. So I mean, the game plan just to go two banks of four, two up top, and then just sort of weather it and then try and catch one on the break. Um, I guess it was the right one. But I mean, long term, that isn't something that you can, you can sort of get away with. You know, for example, at Stoke on Saturday, you, you don't want to be playing that way again, would you? Um, well, it's another away game, so it's, never, it's maybe a case of you know hold. You know, look, you go away from home, and the first thing you're saying is, "Do not concede in the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes." And if there's a hostile, a bit of a hostile crowd, you say, "Let's keep these quiet for as long as possible, and hopefully the crowd will turn on them." That's always sort of the game plan when when you're playing away from home. But also the they have a game plan, let's go and have a go at them and let's test them as well. But do it from like a shape, sort of four four two shape. Let's let's be solid, but we'll have a go at them. Look, you don't go to Burnley and try and outplay Burnley because they're the best team in the division. They're the champions. It's like you don't go to Man City and try and out Man City, Man City at, at the Etihad. You're going to come unstuck because they're too good and they're the best team at doing it. So you don't go to Burnley and try and do what they do and try and do it better. Well, you can, but you're going to open yourself up. So, you know, tactically, 4-4-2 or 4-4-1-1 with a deep line centre forward, like sort of marking around um, their sort of holding midfield players so we don't get on the ball. I mean, Ray Wilk has made me do that quite a lot in my first season where I think we went to Liverpool and he said every time Liverpool have possession, drop in and, and press. John Barnes was like their playmaker in those days when he moved back. So drop in on John Barnes and just block whatever when they so he can't dictate the play. And I used to just drop in, but then I'd go up front when we were on the attack. So in the long run, no, you can't. I don't think. I don't think that is the way to go. I mean, let's be fair. Since Mark Warburton came in three years ago, we've had a style of football that has been easy on the eye, or easy on the eye, but also which the fans really enjoyed. And, and I'll be right, Paul, you're, you're a fan as well, I and you in. But we, we enjoyed that style of football, and it was good to watch. And uh, I don't think um, if you're playing like that at home, I'm not sure. If you don't get the results anyway, there will be a lot of discontent. But, you know, Paul, you sit in LZ Road, I mean, you want to see, we all want to see good football and it be entertained, I'm sure. So what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, I think when you start a season, you've got so many points to play with. You can play the kind of football we saw under Mark Warburton at the start of this season under Mick Bill as well. You know, that kind of really expansive football. I think if you're the manager and you come in with a limit number of games to go, having blown a lot of points and with no form, I don't think... I think if the, if, 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 the, if the manager had come in and, started, and said, I'm going to impose... Any manager had come in and said, I'm going to impose an expansive passing out from the back style of football in February... I think you'd have had as much discontent for that style of football as you are probably getting at the moment for the unattractiveness of the way we're playing. I think next season, hopefully, we're still in this division. You get you, you've got all the points on the board. I would be if we if we're playing a kind of not particularly entertaining football, then I think yeah, then the fans will be rightly at the start of the season going, "Why and what's going on here?" But I, as I say, I think we're in a weird little period where, as a manager, if you've only got a, a finite number of games, so many points already wasted. And you're in the relegation zone. I mean, obviously, we weren't quite there, but we were sort of heading that way when uh, Gareth Ainsworth took over. So I, I don't begrudge him. I, I know there's a lot of complaints about the style, but I don't begrudge him setting up in a way that tries to limit your defeats. And I think that, you know, the players, made, maybe it was a culture shock to them because a lot of them had, came in to play the, the expansive football the last couple of seasons. But it's kind of, it feels like it's paying off. The, the games against West Brom and Norwich, playing in a way that makes us more resolute the first half against Burnley, it is actually getting us the points that at least we can now survive, hopefully. And then next season, when you've got the, the summer to work out your philosophy and, and really instill it into the players and then play with so many points on the board, that's when I, I, I'm, I have no problem with waiting till next season to, to go back to that kind of style. But I think, yeah, if we don't have a more uh, uh, entertaining style of football, which I think will happen, there, there, there will be probably a lot of discontent. <laughs> I think after the game, we, we, we discussed this the other day that, you know, he came out and said, like, you know, possession means nothing. Um, now, he was very raw, very emotional because he just, you know, on the back of a huge win, the biggest win of his time at QPR. 
Um, I mean, in some ways, you, you, I mean, I know you, you kind of work with bands and what have you and dealing with the media and stuff like that. Do you, I mean, do you think sometimes Gareth needs, needs to kind of, you know, not lose his passion, but kind of, you know, mind what he says a little bit than just, if anything, just to maybe get the crowd on side a little bit more? Yeah, I've been surprised actually because there's been quite a lot of people really having a go at him for his interview style, which I I get to a degree because it's like it's kind of similar win, lose or draw. But on the other hand, do you really want a manager, particularly as a player, do you really want a manager coming out after the game going, yeah, they were absolutely awful. I don't, I, I hate them, and particularly with no preseason, you're building the relationships as you're going. I kind of can understand why Gareth's done it, but it's been interesting the kind of reaction to that from a lot of supporters, particularly on social media, as to their their dislike of that of that style. And I think you, the, you, the quote you mentioned about on Burnley about who cares about possession, I think that was more to do with, if you look at the stats at the end of the game, someone has gone to QPR had 19% of, of, of the possession. And you're like, yeah, but they had two of the goals and Burnley only had one of them. So, you know, that that's the st- I think that's the point he was trying to make. That's all that matters about mm. that stat, rather than I don't want to play football with possession and I'm quite happy to, like, you know, be, be out of possession with the rest of the game and play on attractive football. So so I think maybe, yeah, that there is probably that still that adjustment going on. And it's still I mean it must be weird to come into a club because I mean obviously players don't you don't do this with players anymore because of the transfer windows. You come into the club at random times in the season potentially as a manager. This season three managers and you were you know and in a rarely for for, for a manager he's cut had 12 years at one club where you understand the cadences and the, and the nuances of the fan base. You know the you understand what what the local journalist might ask you and how it might be represented. And you've come in in the middle of the season. You're trying to build a relationship with players, and you're trying to speak to the fan base in a way that's going to engage them, like you say, and get people on side. So I think, yeah, maybe it is a learning curve, and it's something that I'm sure Gareth will be will be looking at. I mean, one of the things I mean, obviously, the people I interview, it's very rare you get a band coming off stage. And you go, oh, how was that? I've only ever had it once with a big artist. I won't say the name of who absolutely roasted me because I asked him some silly question. About Come on, folks, he named names. I, 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 I can't, it's all a blur to me. So and, and that afterwards, he apologised. The guy was like, I'm really sorry about that. Stokes, did you just let out the cat out of the bag? It was a bit of a blur to me. Is that Damon Auburn? I, 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 I couldn't I, I couldn't possibly say there, Gareth. Uh, Gareth <laughs> Kevin even, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it was that. It was that. No, it was Damon actually. Actually, I to, it was. Um, it was after they did one of their warm-up shows for the first time when they reunited, and it was being filmed as well for a documentary. And thank goodness it didn't make the documentary. But he was very sweet afterwards. He's like, I'm really sorry. So I mean, I can only imagine what it must be like for a manager or a player when you come off the pitch and go. Someone goes, and you're pumping with energy. With, you know, you've lost or you've won or whatever. And someone goes, ask you a question. You just don't get take the right way, or it was you misinterpreted, or it's actually quite offensive. It must be. I mean, there's no advice I, I I could give as a music journalist to to that sort of world because it's so rare that you would do an interview in in those sort of situations, and you can't understand why modern media training has rendered a lot of the interviews on Sky after matches so dead because people must just be worried about saying slightly the wrong thing, and then yeah, that's all you're talking about for the next week. But mm. Kev, did you have any media training when you were a player? Absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> It showed probably. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Jerry Francis? We look at his shoe, didn't he? Oh, Jerry! Yeah, he was Jerry. looking down at his shoe when he uh, when he did his post match stuff on match of the day. But um, but Kevin, a player we, we we have who made a real impression when he when he came off the bench on on Saturday. And and to be fair to QPR, the second half at Burnley they were a lot better, and you know it wasn't a complete smashing grab where you know they they did create some sort of chances before they scored and and sort of key to that was you know the introduction of Sinclair Armstrong for like the last uh, half an hour and he just came on and just caused havoc just with his pace and power and and um I mean I think you know the style that Angels wants to play you, you kind of think that he's going to be someone that's got can be quite a big part of his plans I mean I know we've talked about him a lot he is still only 19 but I mean down the line Kev are you seeing you know, from what you have seen of him, do you think, you know, he's got a, a real big future ahead of him? Or do you still think there's a, you know, he should, should still be loaned out to, down the leagues? Well, I'll say this, it was an ideal situation for him to come in, as in they've had, all, they've got all the pressure and now we've got, if we do win the ball back, we've got an, we've got an counter-attack because the, Sinclair Armstrong is very powerful and very quick. I mean, physically he's there already. There's no doubt about that. I mean, 
bit like Danny Shitty when we used we used to have to go in and do weights and stuff, and they would say, no, no, you don't have to do any. So uh, <laughs> we don't need you getting any bigger. But you understand, these that powerful and quick. So when you're playing deep, and now you need an out ball to take the pressure off, and you put it in behind, and he's got power, pace, and, and, and energy. Don't know whether he's got the energy to do that for 90 minutes, but for half an hour, he's definitely got the energy to chase after the ball and cause problems for the defenders because there's nothing worse than the ball going in behind and the space in behind. And as if you're a centre half and you're you're chasing and someone's quicker than you are chasing after you. If you speak to any centre half, what's the worst ball in the worst ball they have to deal with? The ball in behind and someone chasing you down. Defenders hate that. So I always say to any kids. <laughs> When they're playing centre forward, the defender hates you running in behind him. That's what Paul McGrath said to me once. We were playing Aston Villa away and he's getting on a bit. And he said to me, will you stop? And then he swore, running in the channel in his Irish accent. And I went, what? Stop running around, please. So the next time someone got the ball, I just ran in the channel. <laughs> he had to chase me. But that's that's what... I think maybe the style of play will suit Sinclair Armstrong in the long run, as in, you know, someone to, you know, Lyndon Dykes flicking it on and him chasing it down. But I think when you play against a team, say a team comes to Loftus Road and has to defend and they play deep, this is where he will struggle because there's not much space in behind and then he has to come to feet and link the play up. I still think he's got a lot to learn. I do believe that this season he should have been out on loan for the season because he would have got more games, probably scored, he hasn't scored yet, scored some goals, got his confidence and then in the summer he would have been firing but because of our lack of sense of centre forward um, uh, players in the squad, the managers, all three managers have decided to keep him uh, at, at QPR. Um, but yeah, look, you can't doubt his enthusiasm and his pace and his power and that enthusiasm and work rate will get any player somewhere. But he has a lot to learn and uh, just like movements and can't always, sometimes I always just feel that when he does play, he always ends up with the ball in a winger's position in the mm. right in the sort of wide areas where he needs to try and get the ball running through on goal more often. Do you uh, think... We'll learn to do that. Do you think, I mean... Could he potentially have a future as a kind of wide forward? Is he playing a four, say a four, three, three. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but it depends what style of football um, we're going to play next season. Whether it, we are going to go a bit longer and flick and and chase, then yeah, he's ideal for that because there's no doubt of his power and space. We're going to play the, like the we have played over the last three seasons. It's not really his game, and I would say he'd be more of an impact sub. You know, if yeah. you're, one nil, you're one, even if you're one nil away from home, you're one nil up away from home, and the other team are coming on top and putting pressure on you and piling pressure, and then the space to counter attack, then he's ideal for that. Yeah, Cause I think it was like this, I want to talk about Brentford, but the Embromo role that he plays for Brentford, where you know Brentford are very, very direct uh, and good at what they do, and. You know, and Bromo last night just come off the bench and just ran at Chelsea and, you know, scored that second goal. I just wondered, you know, because, can I mean, can you, that finesse as a striker, can you can you learn that? Is that something or is it, is it a kind of... I think you can learn it. I think I think it might take a few years, but it can be. Sometimes it's like a play and you just, you're like, no, no. And then it just, I've seen players and then it just clicks and you're like, it's all coming into play. It's all coming together now. How long it would take? It might take six months. It might take two years. I don't know. But you can learn that if you're studying football and you're working hard enough in training and you're practicing. Mm. All this thing about practice makes perfect, doesn't Ray Harford used to say, not perfect, practice makes permanent. Mm. So you know what I mean? Practice your, if you're right foot and you practice your left foot every day within... Within six months, your left foot's going to be a lot better than what it was before you practice. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If you were, say, pre-season, you had him, you were coaching him, what would you be working with him on? What would you be doing with him to kind of... I would be working on little movements, as in, like, 
to go if you want the ball to feet, you have to sort of make a movement before this anyone's got the ball to run in behind and then the centre half will probably run with you and then you come to feet. And if you want to go to the ball over the top, you have to sort of go towards the ball and then spin. Things like that. I try and make him stop running so wide into channels where when he does receive the ball, he's practically on the byline. At the end of the day, he's a centre forward. If you ain't scoring, you've got to be in the width of the box to score goals. You've got to be in the box when the ball's coming in from wide areas. Now, if you're always on the sort of wing in the channel, receiving the ball and then laying it back to the fullback, who then puts the ball in the box, he's never going to score. So you've got to sort of play a little bit more central. That's what I would be telling him to do. But as well, I mean, I guess you don't want to knock that kind of enthusiasm out of him as well, that kind of raw kind of... Because he is, he is such a lovely lad. I, 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 I interviewed him when he went to... He was on loan at Aldershot last year and... Um, you know, footballers speak to people all the time and what have you. Very rarely they remember you, but he always says hello when I see him. And I, it was a Norwich game on Wednesday. I was walking back to the press room at half time and he was walking through with Aussie Cat Guy and sort of said hello. And I patted him on the arm. And I kid you not, he is built like a, he's built like a cruiserweight boxer. Yeah. I just sort of pat, all right, pat him on the arm like that. And honestly, he's like, wow. And you think someone like him running at you at, frightening pace it's going to be a, he's going to be he's, that must be a handful oh 100% he's like I said he's physically um, physically he's he's there as a like he's 19 but he's got the body of a senior pro he's, he's physically he's there it's just now he's got technically and 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 learn the game positioning hmm. Paul he's really, he's really someone that kind of gets you out of your seat doesn't he when he comes on I mean he's 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 got something about him Oh, absolutely. It's so exciting. I mean, just that power and, and his ability to accelerate. I mean, that to me is what really kind of, I think is going to give him that, that, that special quality, you know, once he can add goals to his game, because he just, you look at him and I think particularly player at the moment, he's a bit under the radar for a lot of defenders. So they look at him and think, oh, he's not going to go that fast. Or if he, if he's going to run fast, it's going to take him a while to get up to like his top speed. And his acceleration is amazing. I mean, he just, he can get away from players. I, I remember, remember the first time I saw him properly was probably Charlton in the cup and when he came on. And just, I mean, their, their, their back four didn't really, I, I think I remember the right game, but they just couldn't, they, they just couldn't cope with the fact that he could just run away from them. And it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's rare, you know, with, with the way that defences are now, everyone is sort of, you know, in athletes. It's not that you, you've got a player who can just run away from defenders like that, and particularly, particularly someone so young, uh, you know, who, who, he can make those really useful runs so it's that thing yeah, if he could just add that level of like tactical element to the game I mean I think it would be you know he's going to be a, a really immense player and uh, let's, let's hope before the season's out he could just get that goal I feel he's, he's, he's just lacking that if he has that goal, gets one goal this season that would be just a huge thing for him just as a, just a barrier to get through yeah it'd be a big weight off his shoulders mm. that one goal yeah. and I like it we have mentioned it quite a bit in the past they haven't, Rangers have, have lacked pace since Bright Samuel left the club. There hasn't been anyone with that sort of frightening. I mean, I mean in football, particularly up front, pace is it's a huge asset, isn't it, to have? Just looked last night at Haaland, so that is to have that, that sort of that running power. Um, that's why I think he's, he's, he's probably better away from home and as a sub. Because I don't think he can do it for 90 minutes, that, you know, that 100 mile an hour sort of style. That's, that's difficult. You, you, you've got to train your body to do that. To do that, you know, to play like that for 90, well, 90, set five, seven minutes, that's tough going. So he's probably ideal as being a sub and he's more, you know, away from home. Because where the other team, when you're playing away from home, they leave more space in behind because they might be on the attack. Then ideal for him to come on and, you know, you get the ball, you look up and you say, I can put it 30 yards in behind there and he'll get onto it. And we can now all get up the pitch. Where do you stand on maybe him starting and just letting himself punch himself out for, for an hour? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there, there's a shout for that. But, you know, we're away from home. I, I think we'll probably set up against Stoke, very similar to what we did against Burnley. And we will probably, you know, let them sort of dictate possession a little bit, not as much obviously as Burnley because they're not as good as Burnley, 
and then see how it goes and then, you know, try and hit him on the counter-attack and, and Sinclair Armstrong is, is ideal for that. Um, yeah, interesting. Do we go all out and try and go for the win straight away and put, put them under? It's difficult to know. Sorry, that's my, my missus coming into the room. <laughs> Stop talking rubbish, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, as I was saying, um, yeah, Stoke. So they, I mean, to me, Stoke every season made me look like a bit of, a, bit of an idiot because I think every year Stoke, look at that squad. They're going to be there or thereabouts. And... They're just 16th. And I look at the players they've got, Dwight Gale, Nick Powell, Pearson. They've got some um, Tyrese Campbell. They've got some really, really good players. And I'm I'm a little bit worried about this game Saturday because it's... Well, I'm worried about all the games at the moment, you know, given the form they've been in. But, you know, I mean, the fact the Rangers need to get something out of this. How do you approach it, Kev? Do you think... I think it'll go very steady... Um... Very bit similar to the Burnley game and, and play that sort of style, and then they'll look to the bench and see what and, and see how the game pans out. But I think um, they'll be going very sort of let's keep it tight, let's uh, get the crowd because the reason why Stoke is uh, probably never doing as much because of the expectation of the club. Do you know mm. what I mean? The fan base is bigger than what it should be. Ex Premier League team been down, thinking they're going up got some good players but it hasn't sort of nothing's ever it hasn't really worked out for them and and those uh, jobs for managers is like at Stoke where the expectation is massive you know hard job hard job for anyway so I I, I believe QBR will go in very similar fashion to the a Burnley away game yeah what, what are your predictions then what do you what are you what are you thinking um I think we'll get battered I'm not saying that. Yes, that, yes. We get caned. I'm not putting no predictions this week. But I think we'll get sound out of it. I, I think, I mean, the only problem is, is they've got nothing to play for. And sometimes that can sort of go against, you know, the opposition teams because they've got no worries. Do you know what I mean? They can yeah. go out and play. And is it their last home game in the season? Yeah. So they'll, they'll, they'll want to win for the fans, obviously. Yeah, I mean, they, they, I know they, there's talk about protests from supporters during the game or before the game. Um, so it's not a happy camp up there. Um, my biggest worry is I, I just have this horrible, I, I just want to, the last game of the season, no jeopardy, just enjoy it, sun out, bank holiday weekend. I just have visions of Bristol City, I'm um, knacky wells popping up right at the end, and we're all kind of biting fingernails. So for me, this is. I'll give you the biggest game of the season. I think Rangers, um, I mean, they've had an inability to, uh, maybe a, maybe it's too much self-congratulations, I don't know. But whenever they have a good result, they follow up with a bad result. Um, you know, the West Brom game and the Watford game. You know, Paul, is that is that how you, you feel as well? Do you think there's, um, or do you think the, the, you know, the confidence you get from beating Burnley is enough to kind of, yeah, I think the com I think the confidence is going to be a big thing, and they should go into that game and use that confidence rather than being arrogant or like oh, we're thinking that you should use that confidence. I do get the sense a little bit, and it might just be me reading into it, but just from some of the post match interviews on social media, Sinclair Armstrong pops me up, the Rob Dickey interview, I just get the sense that maybe there is a bit more of a buy in with what 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 the manager is trying to do and keeping keeping the team in the division. So I think there it seems to be a little bit more unity amongst the the, the body language of the squad. Than there was perhaps maybe a couple a month or so ago. I think the other thing as well that gave me a glimmer of hope, which is always obviously terrible when you're a fan, but um, was if you look at the teams like Wigan, uh, Rotherham, uh, Blackpool, they're all teams that if they got ahead, they were going to sit back and it was going to make it really, really hard for, for any team trying to hit them back, and particularly for us. And if you look at the team, and I looked at the run, run that we had, and you think Norwich. Of, of, not Burnley, but but West Brom, and I look, you know, look at the last two games. They are teams that are not going to sit behind the ball. 
if they if, if they're winning, if they're losing, whatever. So I do think that maybe that that, that gives you a gives you a bit more of a chance in these games that you are going to get something. Obviously, I thought we, that against Coventry and that that didn't come to pass. But so um so so I think that's something that that that, that gives me a little bit of hope for for these last two games that they are teams that you're going to be able to that we're going to let you play football and you are going to be able to attack. Um. And so, so I think that maybe the run of fixtures is what perhaps created that that sort of up and down curve of like you've beaten Watford because they've let you play, but then you've played a team who are, who are a lot more defensive minded, and we not really in the the form to to crack those kind of defenses that perhaps we could have done at the start of the season. So hopefully a bit of confidence, the end in sight of the season, and you know it, it must be such a strange season for all players, even if you're having a good season with the World Cup happening in the middle of it. I mean, it's been going mm. on since you know the 90s it feels like so so i mean the fact that you're going to go actually i can t- get some time off i've just got to get these two games it, you know that that sort of energy to, to push and just get us over the line and i think we only, we need a point i think looking at looking at the, at the fixtures that are going to be played against teams against teams so it is achievable so i, I kind of feel like a sort of conservative approach but you know hitting them on the counter you know stoke aren't that far that much far up the league than we are so i think mm. there should be a sense of like yeah you know we, we don't have to go into this game like burnley going let's take a let's take a beating but at the same time just be sensitive about it and just you know keep it tight and even a nil nil draw is fine but you know if you nick something fantastic yeah and then I bristol think... city go for it and have a, have a good good day out because you've taken the jeopardy out of the game yeah hopefully um it's, it's weird because it? i think it's the first match for a long time they're playing and it's an opponent that that doesn't have anything to play for. I think every game that Gareth's had since he's been manager, there's been against a team that's either battling for the playoffs, battling to win the title, or fighting to stay up. So it's almost like a a um, a different sort of scenario, isn't it? That you just sort of and he said this morning he wasn't too sure what to expect because are they, they going to rest players? Are they going to kind of try players out? So you, you just got to go there and just. Do a job, come away with something, and enjoy the summer. So uh, hopefully that's what they'll do. Um, we'll be back next week to um, sort of look back on what's been a, frankly, a very odd season. <laughs> and um, thanks again for all your all your views and comments. It's really greatly appreciated, and the numbers we're getting are, are very good. So thank you all for tuning in, and um, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>